What's up, dudes and dudettes? I hope you are doing well, and if not, I hope your days get better. In this video, I'm going to go over how to adjust your wheel alignment from home with fairly common tools. For toe settings, I'm going to use the string method. Some key tools that you will need for this is a metal ruler with fine markings, a fishing line, a fine tip marker, a level platform, and tools to adjust your components. For camber, I have a camber tool. And for caster, I'm not going to change it, but I am going to talk about it and demonstrate what happens when you do change it. There are several sections to this video, so I'll put timestamps in the description so you can jump to whatever you're interested in or what you want to learn about. I'll also put links or the name of certain products in the description just in case you want to give it a go. So let's get to it. First, let's qualify when alignment should be performed or situations that it may help to at least check your alignment. The most obvious indicator and tool that lets you know the status of your alignment is your steering wheel. In most cases, the wheel clock position and response while driving will let you know what's going on. If your steering wheel isn't at 12 o'clock when driving straight, it's a dead giveaway that there's an issue. Instability over light bumps and erratic behavior may, may also indicate an alignment problem. Sometimes these issues may be caused by worn or damaged parts. So it's important to inspect the car before trying to make adjustments. If you replace suspension components such as tie rod ends, control arms or control arm bushings, shocks or struts, steering rack or subframe, you will most likely need to make adjustments or at the very least check your alignment before getting on the road. For moderate ride height changes, you can usually get away with just correcting the camber, but if you lift or drop a significant amount, a lot more adjustment will most likely be needed. In some repairs, you can avoid needing alignment if you mark, measure, or avoid disassembling certain things. If you replace the tie rod ends, don't disassemble them until you mark the tie rod and jam nut. You can also measure the distance from the end thread to the rod end jam nut. If you remove the steering wheel, be sure to mark where the steering wheel and the steering wheel shaft meet. Some cars have keyed systems, but marking components is a good habit in general. I cover that in my subframe video. My last bit of advice is before you take anything apart, look at the parts involved and think about what needs to be done. Once you have a good understanding of how that particular system works, you'll notice that sometimes you can keep some things together and still perform a proper repair. Okay, now let's set up the garage and perform an alignment. I'll explain some of the terms while we go along and hopefully that will help put everything into context. The first thing we need is a level ground or platform. An alignment needs to be done with the full weight of the vehicle on the wheels, as it is on the road. It also needs to be unrestricted. This ensures that all the settings are accurate for road use. Some manufacturers require placing weight inside the vehicle, so check what your manufacturer calls for. The tires need to be free to move forward, back, side to side, and you also have to make sure your tire pressures are set before doing anything. Creating this type of platform can be tricky, expensive, or both depending on your situation. The easiest solution is to have an alignment rack. The next is a mobile platform that can be leveled and has built-in plates and scale. After that, you have a level concrete slab or surface. If you don't have access to any of those things, you should probably just set the toe the best you can and take it straight to an alignment shop. That's just the ugly truth. I have a pretty level concrete slab and a makeshift low friction surface. So let's make lemonade. To make a low friction surface, I made a sandwich with heavy, heavy plastics and detergent. On the bottom, I used collision wrap. It's a heavy plastic that has adhesive on one side. I cut a rectangle much wider and longer than that of my tire track, and I stuck it to the concrete as flat as possible. So wipe down the concrete before you do that. I then take a squirt or two of detergent and a little bit of water and I spread it with a top layer. The top layer can be a thick plastic drop cloth. If they seem to stick a little bit, just add water and that should give you a good consistency. You can tell when the mix is right when you wouldn't want to attempt to do a push up on them, unless you don't value your teeth. Once that's done, you can roll the car on. Roll the car via pushing. Don't try to drive onto it, it's a low friction surface. You can then put a wheel chuck behind the wheel just to make sure the car doesn't roll on you because safety first. Now that the car is in alignment position, you want to set your steering wheel straight. 
Ideally, you want to lock your wheel in a straight ahead position. But if you don't have the tool to do that, you can just leave a mark on your wheel in a discreet position, or you can use tape. Perception is important when locating your toggle clock, so make sure you are in your comfortable driving position before setting it. Next, you're going to put the car in neutral and then disengage your parking brake. Now keep in mind, once the car is set, you need to be able to make the adjustments to your alignment without moving the car at all. If you move the car, such as jacking it up, you will need to reset and remeasure everything. So at this point, you should be able to reach all the adjustment components and everything is set. And now we can measure and adjust and get ready for the alignment. I like to start with toe. To do that, we have to set the strings. We need to set a precise distance between the string and the center of the wheels. It's good practice to set the distance for all the wheels the same. If you're in a pinch, you can do one side at a time, that's either driver or passenger side. The center of the wheel or hub is considered fixed regardless of your alignment settings, and this is why we use that as our zero point. There are many ways to find the wheel center. The easiest and most accurate way to do it is have the tool that comes in the alignment kit, <laughs> but I'll show you two alternative ways that will work when performed properly. The first method is measuring. Rim geometry is based on circles. With circles, you locate the center by referencing the diameter. Many rim design features use the rim center as a reference, so it may be possible to use them as a reference too. The rule is you have to have at least three points of reference. In this pic, I measured the center cap and now I know my center is half that distance. Make a line at the halfway point. That line uses two points of reference for the center. Rotate the part and then mark the halfway point again. Technically, that's four points, but the more points you have, the more accurate you will be. So you can make more lines if you want. And at this point, you've located the wheel center. Another way to measure is with string. You can reference the outer diameter of the rim or a feature within it. For this example, I use a large outer diameter. I measured two strings, both longer than the diameter that I want. I then mark both at the diameter limit and center point. For the first string, I just matched the marks with the rim and I fixed it to the rim. For the second string, fix one of the mark ends to the rim diameter. Then move the other until the center marks for both strings intersect. If everything was measured and laid well, the string marks should line up with all the reference points and you have located the center. The next method is eyeing the center. And I know it sounds sketchy, but you'll be surprised how accurate it could be if you take your time and do it right. So I'm going to do this in real time. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a rim feature for my reference. This particular rim has a Y shape feature that seems like a simple feature to split and fix a string too. I do one and at a, t at a time, taking my time, making sure the split is symmetrical as possible. Then I find the opposing Y shape and do the same thing. So once I have one string set, that's two points of reference. So, what do I do? I find the next set of Y's to work on. Technically, once I have two strings, I'll have four points. But, for me, that's not good enough because I'm eyeing it. So the more points I have, the better. So I'm gonna put another string. So I'm gonna have three strings in total and six points of reference. Now, if you, I wanted to, I can actually make 10 points of reference just from the Y feature alone. Like I said, if you look at the Y, it makes a circle which is centered around the center. I could use other features as well if I'm kind of iffy on if the Y's were good enough. Now we have a visual reference for our wheel centers. So let's set the distance to the adjustment string. I use identical jack stands to set the height of the string, but you can use whatever you want as long as it holds the string absolutely still and doesn't inhibit you from making adjustments. I try to set the height to be the same as the wheel center. From there, I use my wheel center mark as a reference to set my distance. The distance you set is up to you. Just make sure it won't get hit by you or the wheel when it's adjusting. It's important that you measure and confirm the front and rear distances are absolutely equal. So measure the front and rear axle several times once you think they are good. Now, the string is ready to set the toe. We are going to measure one wheel at a time. 
Measure the distance from a point near the edge of the rim. Do this on the most forward part of the rim and the most rearward part. It's very important to use the same reference points, otherwise this won't work. I mark the rim and string so there's consistency. To track your measurements, I suggest taking notes. I use my garage dry erase board. And don't forget to measure everything twice. This goes for alignments and life. Once you confirm your measurements, you have to interpret your findings. The goal is to have the distances on each wheel the same. If my frontward distance is greater than my rearward, that means I'm towed in. If my rearward distance is greater than my frontward, it means I'm towed out. The goal is to have the, dis the difference equal to zero. To adjust the toe on my car, I'm going to loosen my tie rod and jam nut and rotate my tie rod in small increments. Small increments. On the front, if your distance is two millimeters, then try to adjust by one. This is because the front wheels turn on a pivot. Adjustments will cause opposite reactions between your front and rearward part of the wheel. If your car has adjustable rear toe components, the frontward and rearward adjustments will most likely function independently. Once you adjust, confirm your distances are equal and then check your steering wheel position. Torque your adjustment components if your steering wheel is straight and then move on to the next wheel. After setting all four wheels, your toe is set and your steering wheel should be straight. In most road applications, you want your toe to be zero. Other applications such as road racing may require a non-zero toe setting depending on what you like as a driver. Now before I go on a camber, I want to address something that you may not have noticed, but I definitely think is worth noting. Looking at these figures, my driver front zero length is 28 millimeters, and my driver rear is 27 millimeters. Now how is this possible? The answer is simple, it's not. If my height and distances from the center are exactly the same, my straight ahead measurement should be two. If you do run into this, you have to check and adjust your distance between the line and the wheel center. So this is how mine should look. And yes, these are actual measurements. Now let's talk camber. You can set camber using strings or other systems. It's similar to measuring toe, just using a vertical reference point. The tool I use is much simpler, at least it is in theory. I have a camera tool. A traditional camera tool uses bubble levelers to indicate your camber measurement. Once you level the tool via bubble indicator, use another bubble indicator <laughs> to read the camber. It's simple, but it's accurate. Now there are digital versions, but the accuracy of this is sufficient for what I'm using it for. With a proper setup, it literally takes a couple seconds to set and read measurements for all four wheels. To adjust the camber, it depends on your vehicle and you'll most likely have to lift the vehicle to adjust it. A lot of OBMs use camber bolts. They are can bolts that mount to the shock or strut. As you rotate them, the cam pushes the knuckle which changes the angle of camber. Now, this washer is very important on these systems. The holes on the shock and knuckle are oval, so the cam section of the bolt can fit into them. To fill this gap on the non-cammed sections of the bolt, this nub on the washer acts as a spacer. The clock position of this spacer can affect your camera setting. Since I want more negative camera, I want the bolt as close to the body of the car as possible, so my nub is going to be on the opposite side. Some OEM suspensions and many aftermarket systems have camera adjustment plates located at the top of the shock or strut assembly. You still have to lift the vehicle, but usually the adjustment is a lot easier and the range of adjustability is increased. After adjusting, let the vehicle down and drive it or roll it a couple of feet, at least a couple of feet, to settle the suspension. Then you want to take another me measurement. Camera setting has a wide range of usability opposed to toe. So negative camber might help you get around a turn faster. And positive camber is useful when you expect significant vertical load changes such as hauling or jumping. How you set it up is up to you. Just keep in mind that there's a tipping point where you start to lose function. Now we're going to talk about caster. Emphasis on torque. This is because most road vehicles, it's a fixed position and rarely needs to be touched when doing an alignment. In my opinion, you should only adjust the caster once you have a pretty solid understanding of your vehicle's dynamics and how caster angle adjustment may help in the motorsport or activity that you're participating in. 
So, what is caster angle? Caster angle is the angle between the fixed bottom pivot and your fixed top pivot of your turning wheels. What does that mean? The wheel or wheels that you use to turn a vehicle need to be on a pivot in order for them to turn left and right. Those pivots need to be fixed to the vehicle. The angle of those two pivots affects steering characteristics greatly. In my case, I have struts on the front, so my top pivot is at my strut top hat and my bottom pivot is at my lower ball joint. For double wishbone suspensions, it would be the upper and lower ball joints respectively. To show this, I'm going to use this RC car wheel in my hand as a reference for my caster adjustment. The pivot position in this case will always be perpendicular to my fingers. So let's start with a zero caster position. As I turn the wheel left and right, the load and contact surface is evenly spread across the wheel. Now if I rotate my fingers about 45 degrees towards the front of the vehicle, which would be negative caster, you can see that as I turn the wheel left and right, the load and contact surface shifts from left to right depending on the direction I'm turning. In the extreme positive caster, you'll see the same thing. Because these are such extreme angles, they look like camber changes rather than a wheel turning. Turning a car with this much caster is similar to trying to turn a two-wheel vehicle like a motorcycle with a square shaped back wheel. And as you can imagine, this will change the steering characteristics of a vehicle dramatically. Typically, adding caster will give you more straight line stability. The steering wheel will want to return to the straight ahead position faster, but the steering sensitivity will be decreased. Think sport bike versus a chopper. Now decreasing caster will increase the steering sensitivity, which will inherently decrease stability. Think about the front wheels of a shopping cart. Now because vehicles are dynamic or in motion, weight transfer, mechanical stress, friction, and the rest of your alignment all play roles in determining your settings. And just like many things in life, there's a sweet spot. For a caster angle, it means it works well with everything else in the equation, including your driving style. Once you think everything is good to go, it's time for a test drive. Now, the first time you do an alignment, it's pretty labor intensive, and you may be inclined to not be critical of the results, but you should definitely be critical, especially when it comes to alignment. Try to find a, the straightest, flattest road possible and drive at a moderate speed. Feel for pulling and check the angle of the steering wheel and make sure everything is how you like it. Then you want to drive on slightly bumpy roads and monitor how much, if any, steering direction changes or instability happens. After confirming regular driving functionality, you can then test the more aggressive responses that you're looking for if that's how you're going to use your vehicle. Ignoring issues not only makes the driving experience less enjoyable, it could also damage your tires and other suspension-related components. So, if everything checks out and you're liking it, the alignment is done. If you gave it a couple of tries and it's still not up to par, there's no shame in taking it to a shop. The cool part about taking it to a shop is they'll give you a benchmark so you can test and improve your method because once you get it back, everything should be in spec. I was going to show you guys how I made my camera tool adapter in this video, but technically it's a different subject and it's pretty lengthy. So if it caught your attention, it will have its own video more sooner than later. So keep an eye out for that. But before I wrap up this video, I want to point you guys toward one of my playlists. It's called Suggested Content from Other YouTubers. This playlist has content that I either learned something or enjoy watching their journey. I'm not endorsed by them or anything like that. So it's just me passing along what I think is good content. My other playlists are well organized and I put them there for you guys as well. So to wrap it up, if money and space is not an issue and the alignment rack will probably be the fastest, most accurate way to perform an alignment. A proper platform and mobile tooling will be my second choice. And what I did in this video works, it saves a ton of money, but it's not the bee's knees. Measure everything twice, and if it didn't come out how you wanted it to, give it another go. That goes for everything in life. So until the next time, stay tuned and thanks for watching.